Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, the Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library with Tracy Brimhall. The author of four collections of poetry, in Poetry, New England Review, and The New Republic, just to name a few publications. So as you know, every April is National Poetry Month, and this year we are also participating in the hashtag Shelter in Poetry campaign to celebrate poetry. So welcome, Tracy. Hello. Hi. Would you share a little bit about Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod? And I love the title. So if you could say something, a little bit of something about the title as well, that would be great. Sure. Um, so the land of Nod is actually where uh, Cain was exiled after murdering Abel. He was sent to the land of Nod to be in exile. Um, but it's also the land of like lullaby and dream um, or the land of dream in a lullaby. Um, so I was very fascinated by the fact that this same, this one place or this one name for a place existed as both a place of exile um, for murder and um, also a place of like sleep and dream um, and soothing for children. Um, and in my, one of the things that happened in my life was just that my friend's murder trial was happening while I was pregnant. Um, and my mother died um, a few months after I gave birth. So I sort of had these um, events line up together of bringing new life into the world and feeling a kind of love that I'd never experienced before at the same time that I was experiencing anger and loss and grief and all of these sorts of things. So the book sort of does go back and forth between like murder ballad and lullaby. Um, and the land of Nod is also just the idea of grief maybe as an exile too, um, but also the idea that these, these places can be overlaid with one another. Um, which I think we might not like, right? We'd like to think that there are places of reward and punishment, places of joy and happiness and places of, of, of bad things or that those things don't have to commingle, right? But that um, at the same time, you're celebrating something, you're also potentially grieving something too. So the idea too that the, the good and the bad are sort of inextricably bound, um, which is an especially scary thought when having a child and the world sort of becomes more porous and more personal, um, at that moment when your heart's like walking around outside of you um, and you don't have any control uh, over what your heart then experiences in the world. Um, so the nod as both a place referenced um, in music and the Bible, but also just the role of imagination in grief too. Wow, that's amazing. Do you have a poem from um, that collection that you'd like to share with us at this point? Or would you like to share a poem that you've written while staying at home during this isolating time? Your choice. Sure, yeah, I can. Um, Cause you also asked too about like, what poems do you turn to in times like this? Um, and I don't think, I'm not a person who has a lot of like affirmation poetry around. Um, but one thing that did make me think of was, um, Mary Oliver's The Uses of Sorrow, which is just very simple and only four lines, which is just, um, the title is The Uses of Sorrow, and the poem is, someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Um, and I think that um, I do feel like those, those goods and bads are like totally bound up in one another and difficult to tease apart. Um, and so I did pull up something that I'd, I'd written about um, about this uh, shelter in place time, which I have to admit, I've actually found very peaceful. And I actually feel like I was really built for a plague. <laughs> like, I'm doing really good. <laughs> I'm doing just fine. I'm making all sorts of bread and I'm gardening. I spend a lot of time with my kid. And I'm really, you know, I'm mostly, um, I like too, I was just like emotionally conditioned for crisis. And I tend to do better actually in times that are really difficult and I have a hard time with peace and it's probably a fight or flight response. That's not great, <laughs> but um, I'll examine that at a time that isn't now. Um, but just thinking about like classic plague diaries, one of the poems I've written is titled Plague Diary. Um, and in it is also a prompt for anyone who would want it, um, which is just, 
uh, we live these days of weird routine or non-routine or trying to force a new routine and in, into this open amount of space and time that we don't know um, what's going to happen and so i just use the anaphora um, and many people who are tuning in probably know what that is but if you don't um, an anaphora is just the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of a line or sentence and i just use the anaphora of today um, because one of the things that i know from all of my grief experiences in life is uh is that I wish I'd written more bad poems. I wish I'd let myself fail more and just allow myself to write without worrying about if it, if it became a poem, much less a good poem, but just writing down experiences and observations. I do think poetry is the art of attention. And I think we can pay attention right now, even if we don't feel like we can make a poem right now. Um, I think some people are experiencing kind of both. Some people have heightened awareness right now and some people feel like a lot slower. Grief usually makes me feel a lot slower. Um, but I also like know that because my life is lived at this desk and that kitchen behind me that you can't see because I've got a green screen up, um, that I am noticing a lot more like bird songs and I can now pick some out because there aren't a lot of other sounds in my days. Um, I'm noticing um, when things are rising outside and the, the very daily changes to like the red bud outside my window. Um, I'm just noticing a lot more because there's not a lot of other places to look or not a lot of other places to go. So I do believe in poetry is the art of attention. And I invite people to write with the anaphora of today for as long as they need to, to write down what they're noticing um, and, and keep a record of that, even if that's not a poem. Um, or again, don't have to worry about it being a poem or a great poem, but just, I, I always wish when I look back on difficult times that I'd found a way to record more of it. Um, just what those moments felt like. So after that really long monologue. That's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, no, no, that, that was a great idea. I love that idea of, of writing with the, just repeating the word today and today and today, because so many of us have forgotten what day of the week it is. So that seems like a really good way of handling it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just like, well, and but today I saw this and today, you know, I, I found the first, you know, sh shoot of the carrot or like the cilantro is coming up. Um, whatever the, like the thing is, but just about the day and the record of the days and what that feels like. Because someone reminded me as I was writing about imagined landscapes for grief that the landscape of grief does shift so fast. And even returning to the same place you felt you knew a week or two, a month ago, things will have changed so much. I feel like it's almost a desert landscape in that way of like, it's just gonna move. Um, even if you feel like you know it well, that territory well, things will shift and things will change. Um, and I always feel like grief really brings big company. Like each new grief, I'm like, great, now I have to like go remember all this other stuff all over again and like sort through all of that and see if it still fits back in me in the same place. Um, and so I think that's also a, a difficult thing about this time too, is for a lot of people too, I think it's opening up some things and making us like look at some, some hard stuff. Um, but yeah, that's one of, it's probably a positive thing about grief, but it sure doesn't feel like it when you're sitting in it. Um, but here's a poem that uh, came from a couple weeks ago of just the things I was noticing um, as my son and I were gardening and taking our daily walk. So it's called Plague Diary. Today, my son fell into the knockout roses and a tendril of an old idea of heaven preyed on him and an older idea of forgiveness wept from his leg. Today, beyond the garden, clouds marshaled like white blood cells to an infection and the sun did its daily dying across the burnt prairie. The pink and black of a basement tattoo parlor where a paraclete needled the psalm into my back. Today, my son and I tugged pansies apart. Their roots knotted like a widow's hair. We pushed them into pots and barrels, brightening, no, shocking the dull yard with its still winter brown. I wanted to claw out last year's weeds, pull the fat white tap roots free like spines. But my son ran inside with his neon sandcastle mold to fill and fill the water and wet whatever could still grow. Today, I walked the worn shadows to the pond and congratulated myself on my attention, my ears tuned to the blackbirds, my eyes catching the hawk. Today, my heart, silly little star cup, measured the odd inches of the crocus. The lamb's ear pushed its silver centimeters toward whatever pilgriming moonlight would come to heal, 
but the green disguises of God, who's on his way, but not ready yet to save us, was all, right, all that I found today. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was so touching. Huh, okay. So I look forward to reading your collection, Come thank the you. Slumberless to the Land of Nod Now. Thank you. And Thank you so much for sharing with the Westport Library community. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you at home, oh, you're so welcome. You at home can either purchase Tracy's collection, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod, at your favorite retailer um, and enjoy more of her poems, or you can look for it at the westportlibrary.org website. And you can also find more author videos and information at that same website. Thank you so much for coming today, Tracy, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being part of Shelter and Poetry.